All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are. We have an interesting session uh, this afternoon. Afternoon, my time. Unfortunately, we don't, the turnout is low. It's a Friday afternoon and the last day of the conference. So we expect uh, some level of fatigue from participants. However, this is still a very important topic we're going to discuss today relating to uh, the concept of One Health and uh, sustainable access to healthcare and uh, the, the, the linkage to antimicrobial agents in Kenya. We will be focusing on Kenya. However, the points we'll be discussing also relate to the region, to the East African region. So you hear a lot more about the regional dimensions to this. We know about the issues of uh, antimicrobial resistance. And uh, however, some of the, some of the concepts and ideas and policies and structures we have in Africa has, also, has been, a, have been a design based on practices in the global north. So we, which means there's also some of the challenges are being transferred or carried. So we have issues around system failures, but also issues around regulatory systems and uh, uh, links to policy. So many of these issues will be unpacked. We have a four, three excellent panelists today. The structure will be that we we'll have a, this is a welcome message I'm providing, but also we then have a Frank speak to us about and provide an overview at the first presenter. And then at the next 10 minutes, we'll have Evelyn talk, talk about the One Health concept. And then uh, following that, and lastly, we have a Hillary discuss, provide some insights around citizens uh, generated data related to antimicrobial resistance. So we've passed 10 minutes of my time, plus also a little bit of the time we have. Uh, so I'll hand over to Frank now. Frank, you have some slides. Are you going to share it or would you like us to share that for you? If you can share that, please, uh, uh, Francisco, do we all have access to share screen, yeah? Yes, you do. Okay, so Frank, I'll hand over to Frank. So after the 10 minutes presentations each, we'll, we'll have a session of discussion. Hopefully we'll get a, a, some more people to join us by then. Otherwise, we'll still get feedback from, from the team we have. And following the discussions, we'll then have a, a wrap-up session where we have a, Evelyn will provide a, some, some of the wrap-up contents, what we're taking, and then, um, and then uh, Frank will conclude us as the project lead for this. So Frank, can I hand over to you? Yeah, um, good evening. Here in Kenya is uh, evening. Thank you. Uh, Francisco, will you please share the slides for me? Sure, one second. All right. So, you know, particip participants, I will just want to introduce myself. My name is Frank Ndakala. I work in the Ministry of Education in, um, in um, a state department for university education and research. Uh, basically, we are the ones who provide leadership when it comes to uh, research, science and technology, science, technology and innovation policy. And um, it's from that angle that we have uh, we are very keen on following out what is happening internationally when it comes to innovation policies, or as we like calling them, science and technology policies. Um, uh, today, this evening, I will be talking, taking you through our one or a deep initiative, transformative innovation initiative um, on scoping uh, transformative change in antimicrobial stewardship. Next slide, please. Yeah, the uh, TIP, we, we started uh, the TIP initiative as members of Transformative Innovation Policy Africa Hub, which, is a, which was a pilot project involving Kenya, you know, Ghana, Senegal, and South Africa. And um, in our first initiative, we looked at um, nomadic education. And we had a case study on mobile schools. This work was supported by, you know, SPRU, you know, and we were being guided by our senior, uh, you know, member state from South Africa who had joined TIP before us. So we provided mentorship 
And uh, we looked through what is happening in the Kenyan education system, especially nomadic education. The nomadic people are very few, but they occupy a huge chunk of land, uh, close to about out of 47 counties, we have you know, 21 to 22 you know, counties that are, you know, uh, that are semi-arid, and this is where the nomads are found. To add on that, nomads are also found along the lakes and rivers. We have river lake and ocean and nomad. So nomadic education covers a lot, and, and, and um, it's not part of, it's not being recognized as part of the conventional you know, education system. So that one was a unique way of looking at social innovation that has been very impactive, impactful. And what we found out is that uh, uh, this was a community-led initiative, which is very good because you know it's accepted by almost everybody, and it's a flexible model of education where they don't use the conventional you know uh, parameters or, or, or models like uh, in uh, scheduling of classes. They can go any time. They don't have to put on uniforms and the things that we are used to in our conventional education. So um, the good thing about the market education, it had a huge impact at that low level. It hasn't reached, it has not reached high school, but the pre-primary and, and lower primary, where it is impacting, you can see how multi-sectoral that impact is. It impacts on agriculture, health, human health, animal health, wildlife. Uh, and we discovered that one of the things that these people are doing or these mobile schools are doing is to sensitize people on how to incorporate traditional way uh, lifestyles with the conventional. Even in agriculture, they are using uh, modern medicine. And unfortunately, they are inheriting bad habits that we have in our systems. So that provoked us to look into, uh, you know, a, a little bit a complex system uh, of, of how we dispense, how we access medicine medicines or drugs yeah, in the region because nomads are you know all over Africa so if we allow them to use uh, you know medicine in a, you know in, in in that manner then it will be very very unfortunate because they will uh, they will it will be going to endanger their their lives and the way they are secluded they are not they cannot access a lot of services if they cannot access schools it means they cannot access hospitals so if they are accessing drugs some of them were even using animal drugs for you know treatment for human ailments because of lack of knowledge because of lack of certain services so that thinking provoked us to look at what is really happening when it comes to accessibility to drugs and what are the enablers and, and challenges that are in that sector and um, uh, because of that kind of uh, next slide please Because of that, we, we, we moved into our next initiative on how do we improve uh, quality of antimicrobial stewardship programs in Kenya. But this time, because we had some knowledge about how what TIP is doing at the international level, we wanted to use that approach to you know, focus on antimicrobial stewardship in Kenya. So the main goal of this second initiative which is being supported by those institutions down there, the you know, government of Kenya, our institu Kenyan institution, uh, National Commission for Science and Technology, University of Nairobi, Friends University College, Kenya Medical Research Institute, the Ministry of Health and Agriculture, and our international partners, Pfizer and uh, University of Sussex. So the main aim of this project uh, initiative is to co-create new knowledge, you know, using tip lens to co-create new knowledge between researchers, policymakers, practitioners, um, knowledge that can have, that will have, you know, high potential to bring um, transformation in treatment outcomes, regimes, routines, and standards. There are a lot of things that are uh, in, our, in our regimes that, that need to be changed. The behavioral patterns of our practitioners and policymakers, we need to change that. And of course, we need to uh, reconfigure our actors. There are so many actors that have been left out of that um, antimicrobial stewardship space, especially civil society, uh, mission hospitals, and uh, non-governmental organizations. They operate outside the space that, um, uh, as a government, we would like to, to, to be part of. Next slide. 
So, you know, those are the approaches that we are using the transformative innovation approach and uh, learning histories. And of course, basic science where we'll collect quantitative data that can enable us to link success stories to the theories and the policies that we are implementing. Next slide, please. So those are the sites. We have three regions where we'll be, we have been carrying this study, Nairobi Coast region, uh, Eastern, Western, Central and Rift Valley. And uh, I don't want to go into the details of the sites. Uh, next slide. And this is the progress so far. We have mapped out, you know, from literature and uh, real literature and the policies that we have. And uh, we have those two reports, antimicrobial stewardship landscape, which is a desktop review of what is happening internationally and locally. And then we have the kickoff meetings reports. We have introduced the project to the county governments and regional players and actors. Next. Next slide. So this is what has been happening internationally. We, of course, the enabler of our local policy, one of the enablers is uh, the international players and what WHO, World Health Organization has been a very key player in that. You can imagine on your right where we have the first, the discovery of antimicrobial resistance where penicillin was observed to be, uh, you know, to be useless at that time in 1943. It was becoming useless when it come, you know, it, you know in treating um, anti, you know, anti I mean, anti bacterial infection. But WHO from 1943 or in the 40s, WHO started acting in 1959. And then in 2015, that is when serious business started happening. People are now agreeing that it is a danger to have, you know, antimicrobial resistance spreading. Next slide. And this is what has been happening in Kenya. In 2011, you know, just a decade ago, up to 2016, we are just doing, we are having some anecdotal kind of studies, which we put as our situational analysis. And uh, that informed the development of, that was part of the local data that was used to inform the national uh, policy and uh, action plan on and microbial resistance. And uh, so far up to 2021, we have all those policies, the infection prevention policy, infection you know, monitoring and evaluation tools, and diagnostic stewardship, uh, you know, handbook. These are the tools that we are, we want to interrogate their implementation and see how TIP can help. Next. And uh, this is the journey since independence. In the 1960s, we have gone through three frames of innovation. The first frame, R&D, the second to the frame, national uh, innovation system, and the emerging one, which is transformative innovation policy. You can see uh, we, as a country, in the 1960s, we had, you know, just five-year development plans and health as an issue was just being captured as a component of national development plan. It was at, in 1994 when we had some specific health policy and up to date, um, the, the, a lot of things, a lot of the experiments that we've been having uh, started in 2010 when the constitution, a new constitution was uh, put in place when we had right-based healthcare and devolution. And uh, so far we have been, you know, developing policies right, you know, left and center, just to ensure that we incorporate transformation in that particular, uh, in, our, in our system. Next slide. And um, these are the experiments that we are so far, our current policies have enabled us to do that. Inclusiveness, it is entrenched in our constitution that for us to develop any policy, any law, we have to consult, people must participate. Something very, very, very important. And um, the whole of government approach, we have done some experiments with the whole of government approach, where when you are conceptualizing an idea, you have to, be, to imagine how far on who are the players in government, you know, from security, healthcare, every, everybody, bring everybody in government so that we don't, we avoid wasting time on legal issues. If, if you plan as, a, you, know, you know, the Minister of Education or the Minister of Health, if you plan on your own, sometimes you waste time when people go to court, the civil society, 
can go to code and they will step, you know, they will, uh, whatever you are doing will be stopped. One health approach has uh, actually been an approach that is helping us to refocus on how to work with many partners. You know, it's just close to, to, to uh, the whole of government approach. And one health approach is very important because uh, it helps us imagine the future with all these players and how do we navigate through the challenges that we have and how impactful our program is going to be. Uh, one of the most interesting experiments that we are having in Kenya is universal health coverage. It is taking the whole of government approach where county governments are collaborating with national institutions like the National Insurance uh, Health NHF and, and um, we are doing experiments to collect data on what works and um, uh, for Kenya in four counties that were considered to be or prioritized for these particular experiments on universal health coverage. So national institutions are working with, um, you know, county governments and other, you know, players to ensure that we have uh, universal health coverage in those four counties. Uh, I think Chuck, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, this is a, there are many dimensions to this project. One of the dimension being is also bringing innovation, both government, but industry and the and the academia as actors in this project. So this is very this is very important uh, uh, aspect of it. I don't know, Frank, if you mentioned that is being funded by industry by Pfizer. If I'm if yes, I'm right, that. yeah. So that. so that is a very important dimension to see how we applying transformative innovation principle, and then industry is also seeing it as, a, as an important element to take note of. But thank you for, for, the, for the institutional systems you have discussed, but also the, the point around the transformation. And then uh, linking us, providing the, providing the background on the policy space and the, and the framing. Uh, the one health initiative uh, the one health concept we now go a, a little bit more into detail of actually what's happening what frank has done is to provide the overview of kenya the innovation policy space but just to lead us a little bit into it we're going to go into more depth now with the next presentation by evelyn evelyn um, are you ready and uh, and then to hear a lot more about the one uh, one health concept so thank you evelyn we'll hand over to you to give us more of the practice and the, the actions and the and implementation aspect of the project. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon and good evening uh, to all our colleagues. Um, and I just want to say thank you to, to the organizers for giving us an opportunity to share uh, antimicrobial stewardship from the lens, uh, lens of um, transformative innovation policies. And I think Frank has given a very good background uh, around what has been happening at a global level. And I think for us, uh, from where we work, I work with the Ministry of Health in Kenya. I lead the antimicrobial resistance efforts, uh, especially within the health sector. And I think having to look at this work from a different perspective makes a big, a big difference when it comes to policy development and policy implementation, especially when you realize that you are slow and uh, just building up from what Frank said and looking at the timelines uh, that he shared on one of his slides, very interesting, from 1956, when WHO had a technical uh, group of experts looking at antimicrobial resistance. So what is it that, uh, that did not shift until 2014, uh, when now the, the world began to take action against AMR? So clearly there are aspects that we missed along the um, along the, the timelines that probably would have caused uh, changes in terms of behavior earlier. So I'd just like to take up from that perspective and share country experiences, especially uh, when it comes to One Health, and I'll make reference to that as I go through my, my presentation. Um, so of course, just as a, a brief background on the policy, um, on the policy and action plan, which we have developed at a national level and the status of implementation through to health systems and antimicrobial stewardship. And finally, the place of integrated antimicrobial stewardship and all that means when you begin to look at it from that lens of, um, of uh, uh, transformation. So I think we are in this space because of the complex complexity that um, antimicrobial resistance has posed. And uh, just yesterday, 
there was a release of um, a global antimicrobial resistance report that tried to demonstrate the burden of AMR globally. Looking at the number of deaths uh, that were projected in that study by the, uh, that was published in the Lancet, that actually showed that deaths related to AMR had actually already surpassed HIV and any other condition that uh, we had thought was, uh, was a threat to us. So it is a complex public health problem because of the multiple sources uh, of, um, of the cost of AMR and the multiple points of intervention that, that all need to run hand in hand to make sure that you have effective intervention. So again, you're looking at it, and when, he, when Frank has just talked about the, um, the policy development processes, the stakeholders involved, what is clear even for us in the AMR space is that no single organization or government can solve AMR. So if you miss out on the process of mapping out your critical stakeholders and not just mapping these out, but engaging them for effective development of policies and, and later on the uptake and the implementation of the, um, of the proposed solutions and it becomes a challenge, then you have gaps that cannot be closed. So it means that we need to have deliberate coordination and collaboration between key stakeholder groups, government, civil society, and the private sector as well. So with that realization at a country level, we were able to come together as um, two lead sectors. And you can see we developed the National Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance in 2017. And you can see that uh, we, we actually were able to do this from a multidisciplinary perspective. And now thinking through the lens of trans transformational innovative policies, we are beginning to think, could we have done this differently? But this was a starting point where this policy was actually driven by the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Agriculture. Other key sectors like environment had not boarded the process in, um, in, in, a, in an effective manner. And we think we should have done this um, differently, but we have an opportunity because then that means that this year as we review our policies, we can look at them from a different lens with all the new information we have in, on different ways of approaching policies, implementation, mapping of stakeholders, inclusivity, uh, just trying to change the thought processes to support better uptake of these recommendations and their implementation. So of course this was um, endorsed and we began to implement based on what the kind of guidance that we had gotten from the global level. And again, making reference to Fla uh, Frank's slides where he ran through the timelines the endorsement of the, uh, of the WHO Global Action Plan for Antimicrobial Resistance. And after that was launched, countries were stuck with respect to implementing antimicrobial resistance from a One Health approach. And that prompted the, the, the development of this paper um, that is in a series of um, papers that are trying to address multi-sectoral coordination. But I think I, as I inter interact more with the transformational innovative policies, I realized this is a critical element that probably needs to be incorporated into the development of this global guidance, especially when you have multi-sectoral uh, aspects that are, require, uh, um, are required to support the implementation. And I make reference to that uh, middle image uh, or illustration that talks about the National Action Plan as a plan of, uh, of plans. The AMR plan at national level is not just a health sector plan, it has components that target the plant sector, that's the agricultural sector. There are components that target the environment and the animal uh, health sector. So you see really, and when you go into these different sectors, if it's the environment, they have specific strategies that will have a big bearing on our stewardship opportunities or, um, or, uh, or intervention. Same to the animal health sector. And there are multiple, just looking at all these aspects that need to be part of the National Action Plan for Antimicrobial Resistance, then it means that we must um, actually think through the processes. Because if you talk about maternal and child health, you talk about the sustainable development goals, you talk about environmental management, you talk about basic things like soil management, which of course have an impact on antimicrobial resistance, water resources, all these aspects have to be considered. So because countries got stuck in terms of trying to implement such complex plans, then another working paper followed the initial one that talked about tackling MR, and that was turning plans into action. When people begin to talk about turning plans into action, that means implement, implementation hit a snag. And I think when we go back and begin to evaluate, then I think there is a place for the transformational innovative uh, policies to actually help 
these plans move from just being paper to actual implementation. So our national action plan has five strategic objectives like you can see, and our focus uh, on objective four is on appropriate use of antimicrobials, what we call antimicrobial stewardship. And um, we go back to evaluating our capacities. And I think this is critical, even as we evaluate the approaches that we have taken in implementing our policies over a period of time, we realized when we started this process, our capacity for antimicrobial stewardship activities was limited. We were at two because we didn't have programs, we didn't have the plans, we didn't have the strategies that would provide guidance for um, implementation of antimicrobial stewardship at activities at a national level. And I look at it because, again, there is a confusion when it comes to understanding at different levels. And I think um, in innovation uh, from the transformational uh, uh, approaches, I think, will play a big role here. Because when you have an issue that is not fully understood, that has a language problem, then even understanding and unpacking the problem from a One Health approach, which means you're looking at multiple sectors, Every sector interprets stewardship in a different manner. So how can we use a different approach to make sure that we are all on the same page and have understood what it means to implement? So when I look at the national level, it will look at it will encompass broader issues. You're looking at regulation and legislation. When I go into the institutions, for example, at the hospital level, they're looking at teams, they're looking at access, they're looking at patients. When you look at the multidisciplinary approach, every specialty will come with their own definition of the problem and their own set of actions. So the place of inclusivity and understanding the process and learning from the processes, I think becomes a key element if we are to see a difference in uptake of recommendations. So of course that uh, will affect the, the steps and the elements that will be um, uh, addressed in terms of uh, taking on a public health approach for antimicrobial stewardship and hopefully thinking in a different direction. So we developed our stewardship guidelines for the national level to primarily give direction to healthcare settings on how to establish and run antimicrobial stewardship programs, both within those settings and at the community. So we've been able to describe the framework and the approach and what is required and what is available to support uh, import, uh, implementation of MS in Kenya. So we ask ourselves, so with all this information provided, why is it that we have still not made as much progress as we had an anticipated before? And probably we, we will answer some of these questions once the project is, is over and we have learned from uh, the, the experiences that we have gone through. So our um, framework for stewardship is built on a balance between three pillars, development of new molecules, access, which is critical for stewardship, and the actual rational use of whatever we have had access to. And in this case, we make reference to the medic medicines and also the diagnostics that are available. And we are looking at a complex um, uh, process because it's not just about the use. We are looking at the research and development through to regulation and manufacturing. We are looking at selection, procurement and supply and distribution, diagnostics, prescribing, dispensing and responsible use. And in all these levels or layers, we have different players. The players in regulation and manufacturing are totally different from those on in diagnostics, prescribing, dispensing, and use. So understanding their place and what challenges they, they have in terms of executing their mandates then comes clear as we identify the gaps and propose practical strategies to ensure that everything is in place to support the implementation of the guidelines. So we are looking at the core elements and again, looking at now getting into institutional stewardship programs proposing that when you have leadership, commitment, and proper governance structures, hopefully you'll be able to implement your processes well. And then there's a place of accountability, uh, having the right expertise and uh, having actions and interventions that are practical and uh, sustainable and implementable. Having reporting process structures in place so that we understand what's happening to guide our learning uh, uh, and uh, implementation later on. And of course, having strong m &E systems that will support education and training, improve communicate, communication, and finally embed a quality improvement aspect just to enhance the sustainability of these um, interventions. So we have created governance structures for antimicrobial stewardship, as you can see, not very simple. That just shows you the number of players that are in one um, 
one team, for example, like the antimicrobial stewardship program, the linkages have to be very clear. And that builds up onto the aspect of inclusivity and, um, con con and, and, and having conversations that will lead into consensus building when people have understood their different roles and their place in stewardship, it makes it easier. So of course, again, looking at the complexity of the governance system in the country, where you have, we have a devolved system of governance, different actions from the national level right through to the facility and community. That also brings in another layer. And um, I think in our, in our next session, Hillary will address some of these things. If you leave out any of this in the process of development of policies and even at the implementation level, we still have a, a challenge. So of course it's stepwise when you're establishing these com uh, committees. And, and I think looking at it again, it's not about the development of documents and policies and guidelines, but how well have these policies been put together to ensure that at the point of implementation, everyone is able to pick up their piece and run with it. So, and, um, and I think that's critical because then it helps us to get the right um, outputs and outcomes and hopefully be able to build a case even to support investment in future. So we identified some of the potential pitfalls and how we can mitigate this. And I hope as we carry out um, uh, the work through the, the project currently, we will identify more pitfalls in terms of supporting effective implementation of policies and mitigation. Um, and this will be a very strong learning point even for the policy uh, making level. Of course, monitoring is important. If we have no considerations for this, then we'll not be able to learn. And again, setting up systems from scratch, I think is important. Um, is, 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 is just to know that they are challenging, especially in areas that are complex like antimicrobial resistance and even the stewardship component, which has multiple players. So what data do you collect? Who does the collection? How do we report to the various target audiences? I think all these things need to be well guided to be able to give us the what we require. So as I, I end my session, that snaps um, the MR program and stewardship. Some of the things that um, come out clearly is that we need effective governance and it requires much more than the multi-stakeholder approach that we have taken to plan and deliver services. So what's the role of having a transformational innovative policies in effective governance, for example, and we also have realized that we have uh, to have a mix of both a regulatory and persuasive strategy. And you see, without looking at it like from the tip perspective, the persuasive strategy then is, um, is, is limited because when you want to have public engagement to achieve cultural and behavioral change, we need to think about other sets of innovative approaches to support our policy and regulatory um, our tools that we have. And again, the place of having opportunities to establish consistent communication channels, like we've said across multiple stakeholders. And what we say at the end of the day, we know that the adoption and the uptake of these antimicrobial stewardship strategies will be influenced by the underlying health system and the culture that is within any organization, whether it's at the country level, the county or the institution level. So we need to look at this from a different perspective because we know that uh, the current approach is limited uh, uh, because five years down the line, and we have not been able to achieve what we would have hoped to achieve within five years, then it warrants uh, a, a look into the approach that was taken both in developing the policies and uh, eventually their implementation. So I will stop there and I want to say thank you. And I hand this uh, session over back to you, Chucks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evelyn. That's very impressive, but also a, a lot of uh, rich information there in terms of re-echoing some of the points that uh, Frank made around the government, but also the ministry work. But bringing a more practical understanding of, uh, of what the One Health is actually about. So you, you've raised very important points that will feature in our discussions. Uh, after the after we will hear from Hillary, we'll have a three set of questions to look at to, to help guide the discussions, but you've already pointed to some of them, issues of uh, 
policies and regulation, but also monitoring and evaluation, learning, governance, and, the, and the, the, the need to, for taking a systems approach. So thank you for, for, for that deeper insights you've provided. We'll hand over to Hilary now, who's going to give us a present a different view of this, the citizens generated data, the citizens aspect of this. We've, we've listened to the policy part, listen to the also the, the implementation aspect. So now we want to hear from, um, from Hilary. Hilary, your slide has disappeared. We can bring it back on. Uh, I'll stop can... sharing. I'm okay. Not okay, go keep sharing. So we want to hear from you and then uh, understand the uh, tips is around inclusion, but also a grassroots and citizens, a very strong focus on that. So engagement is very important. So we'd like to hand over to you to present that pers perspective to us. Thank you. Yes, good evening. Thank you, uh, Chucks. Thank you, Evelyn, and thank you, Frank. My name is Hilary Kagwa. I'm a clinical pharmacist by profession. Uh, I also coordinate an uh, antimicrobial resistant activity in, in a county called Kiambu in Kenya. As Dr. Evelyn has mentioned, uh, there are various levels of government where we are, uh, we are tackling this uh, pandemic of AMR. At the national level, that's where Dr. Evelyn works. Since the health is, is a devolved function, I work at a county level where I coordinate antimicrobial resistance activity in a county called Kiambu in the, in the central part of Kenya. So a lot has been talked about antimicrobial resistance. And I think from Frank and Dr. Evelyn's presentation, at least now we have a grasp on, on what we do and how it's structured in terms of leadership and governance. And mine will be going lower to the implementation level where we try to, to drive or to implement the policies that are developed at the national government. So what I'm going to present is just a, is an innovative way we thought of collecting data from citizens because we realized most of these strategies, we do them I, in boardrooms or in offices, but the, the, the public need to be involved. So that won the process and to understand these issues because you, you can formulate all the guidelines and the action plan, but you need to involve the, uh, the consumers of the antimicrobial. So this is a study uh, that was done. I'm just, this is a brief introduction. I think this one has been mentioned. Uh, I think there is even more recent data from Lancet, like what uh, Dr. Ibn has mentioned. AMR is it now has overtaken HIV and malaria in terms of causing deaths uh, globally. And according to uh, literature, if you don't uh, take action now by 2030, 24 million people could go into extreme poverty because of the aspect of having to switch to more expensive drugs, draining the family income. So yet data, we still have an issue with data on, on AMR. I think Dr. Ibn and Frank has alluded to that. So just to mention, there's this GLASS, uh, Global Antimicrobial Resistance and Use Surveillance System that was launched, that was launched in 2015. Uh, the intention was to collect official national AMR data primarily through surveillance system from across the, the world, especially in Africa. I think it's uh, based somewhere in Southern Africa. So, but uh, even looking at the data that we submit as Kenya, I think from 2020, 2019, that's when we started uh, submitting data there. So the purpose of this study, the, uh, which we are calling citizen-generated data, it seeks to increase data capture on this issue of AMR. So, and this data is very unique because when you engage the citizens, the, there are some things that will never capture from just reporting the resistant patterns. When you engage the citizens, at least you are able to, to analyze or to to, to become aware of their citizen knowledge levels as regards antimicrobial resistance and use. Then you also have an engagement of their perceptions and drivers of behavior. What drives them to, to, to maybe use or misuse antimicrobials? So this one will help close the AMR data gaps which you really need, catch data. We also empower the citizen to take action on AMR. This aspect of self-care is really being pushed and I think uh, as a primary healthcare aspect, we really need to enforce it so that citizen not just about AMR, even in terms of uh, an uncommunicable disease, the chronic illnesses. Citizens need to be empowered to take care of their health. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> excuse me, at the end of the day, this will spark data-driven action by policymakers, because at the end of the day, when you submit this data, the, the policymakers have, have at least data to act on as they make the policies. So just this, uh, I just go click go through this, it was a global partnership for sustainable development that collaborated with the African Voices Foundation, which is an NGO, to generate and disseminate insights on AMR in Kenya using the city-generated data. We got funding from an organization called Welcome Trust. 
So the method that we used to collect data from citizen are interactive. We had 11 weeks of interactive radio shows. They used to come on Thursdays in the early in the in the mid morning. So interactive radio shows and SMS or mobile texting message service. So I'm just going to explain a little about that. Uh, Kiambu County, this study was done across the country. It was done in three counties, Kiambu, central part of Kenya, Kilifi towards the coasts, and Bungoma towards the western part. And basically for the 11 weeks we used to identify, we used to move around in, in, in the communities for in the different, our counties divided into sub counties. So Kiambu has, I talk about Kiambu because I coordinated uh, the one in Kiambu. So we had 12 sub counties where we identified the uh, healthcare workers, we put them in a room and we put mothers with children below 12 years. Why? We, we, <clears throat> according to analysis, we realized that the group, because of the babies having issues, maybe uh, infections, mothers tend to abuse antibiotics. So we, and then for women, I think they are more, how do I put it? At least when you educate the women, there's a thing that, that says when you educate women, you educate the whole community. So I think the, we also educate them as important, uh, spreaders of this information. So, and basically the research touched on three main questions. The first question was knowledge around disease and drug resistance. What did you want to know? What is citizens' knowledge on, of AMR and its consequences? Do they know? What is their knowledge on, of, of antimicrobials and reason for thinking antimicrobials? So that was the first question. The second question we wanted to do, the reason for use or misuse of antimicrobials. What are the citizen practices in using antimicrobials? We had an interactive session where they shared how they use antimicrobials and we really came up with the interesting findings. What are the prescribing and dispensing habits on antimicrobials, especially since we also engage healthcare workers to get their view? And then uh, as regards the second question, what is the level of adherence to regulation on drug use and misuse? I think Dr. Evelyn mentioned about uh, weak pharmaceutical regulatory systems. We also wanted to get their perspective uh, on that. The third question we wanted to, to, to assess, uh, to, to know accessibility and availability of antimicrobial, especially in the public sector. So what are the drivers for stocking and selecting antimicrobials at the pharmacy or health facility? So we also incorporated, we wanted to engage them where they are aware of, uh, of the One Health approach. And also we did uh, the gender dimension to AMR. We are going to see the data on that. We also identified as cross-cutting issues to interrogate. So I'll, ju I'll just quickly, just really jump into the results. This is a summary of the data disaggregated by age, gender, location, and disability. So most of our participants fell under the age of 18 to 35. A few are below 17, then 36 and above. We also tried to, to, to capture even the people with disability. We wanted the opinion. So at least 13% had a, had a form of disability. And gender distribution, the males were a bit higher, 51%. And this is the map of Kenya. So for those who have not been to Kenya, this is the coastal part. This is why we have the Kilifi County. This is where I work. It's called Kiambu County, it's right at the middle of uh, central Kenya. And Bungoma, we wanted to cross cut. And this study we wanted to do it in more counties, but I think uh, depending on the funding available, we concentrated on those three. So we wanted to spread them across the country so that we can get uh, more meaningful data or uh, a representative data, <clears throat> excuse me. So these are the, the methods I mentioned. So we had a total across all counties, the three counties, we had 38 live interactive radio shows hosted on four local radio stations across the targeted location. So we used to use the vernacular, the languages that they understand. So depending on the tribe or in, in that region, we engage them on radio shows uh, using the vernacular radio stations. So we also had listening groups. As I said, the mothers with uh, children below 12 years and healthcare workers, we had a total of 48 listening group discussion conducted. We provided them with a code where they could send the messages right from the, the first week to week 11 in all the counties where they were it's a service to send the message and it was free of uh, free of charge where they could send their opinions about the topic each week had a different topic I, it's only that i did not want to make the presentation long so every week they could we could remind them to send messages about that topic and there were various topics touching on antimicrobial resistance 
So we also, this one I was explaining, the deployed a short baseline end line SMS survey at the end of it all to track any change in knowledge. So after, from week one, after we completed the exercise, we went back and tried to analyze whether there was change in behavior and the usage of antimicrobials. We also had some key informant interviews conducted. So that's a engagement with the public. We used to do very informal settings so that they could air, air their views uh, freely. These are another cohort of uh, healthcare workers. I'm here myself bending down. So we had a group of uh, the public, especially mothers with kids below 12 years and healthcare workers cutting across all cadres. So the data, just to mention, the SMS messages received during the shows were analyzed using in-depth qualitative and quantitative analysis, including regression analysis to identify statistical associations across topics, demographic groups, and the levels of uh, participation. So these were the findings. So the, there was a question that we asked, how well informed do you think you are, your community is on the appropriate use of anti anti antibiotics? So, the orange is the baseline when we started and the blue is at the end of the 11 weeks. So those uh, who, so, who said they, they are not informed at all stood at 49. At least we are glad by the end of the survey, the number had reduced to 31%. There are those who had said they are they were a little bit informed about appropriate use of antimicrobials or antibiotics. 40% when we started, at least by the end of the survey or the study, we had marginally increased by 7%. Those who had said initially they are well informed about the appropriate use were 6%. At the end of it all, at least it had increased to 8%. Very well informed. So I think this is very interesting. 4% thought they knew very much about antimicrobials. But after the discussion, because the interaction was not just getting their views, also from a healthcare profession and myself as an AMR uh, champion, we could share the information to enlighten them. So at least at the, uh, at the end of it all, those who thought they were well informed, they had increased from 4% to 14%. So we also tried to do the gender di uh, difference on community knowledge at the baseline. This at the at the beginning, at least for ladies, there was that gap, those who are little or no informed, very well informed, it was, uh, a small fraction, at least this uh, is encouraging. At, uh, at the end of it, or at least those who are very well informed is the white part. At least it had increased marginally, but and more so with the males. So when we engage the citizen, we, we, we reach, we, we, what did the citizen we reach want to know about AMR? These are the questions they asked us. So most of them asked about antibiotics. How do you use them? Who should prescribe them? Should they finish the dose? All those issues. So we had discussion on use and overuse of antimicrobials. There was concern about generic and original brand antibiotics are they effective or ineffective. Interestingly, because we also, by the way, in a cohort of uh, participants, we also included people from the animal health and environment health. So there were questions about AMR in animals. Do I do I still take the milk when the when the, maybe the cow is is on antibiotics? There was interesting also uh, inquiries about herbal remedies, risk of antibiotics. They were really keen to know about what is the risk of using them anyhow. Healthcare assess a very really, uh, big problem because they're saying maybe when they go to a health center, it's crowded. So I prefer going to a chemist to buy directly. So well, they, want, they also 1.1% uh, wanted to know the effects of antibiotic on pregnant women, where we explained about the classification about the, and the safety of the antibiotics in pregnancy. And a few wanted to know about throat the diseases because they complain when they get sore throat, they go get an antibiotic from a chemist. So uh, at the end of it all, this is just a summary. We try to identify the drivers of antimicrobial resistance. And what really came out is that uh, there's risky health seeking practice of uh, anti uh, antibiotics among citizens. The aspect I've said, they think they are going to save time and money. Instead of going to a hospital where they'll have to queue, they go to a clinician, they are sent to the laboratory, then later to the pharmacy to get the antibiotics. So most of them just prefer going directly. They have already self-diagnosed. They said, I know I have malaria, I have this, I have pneumonia. So they, they, they identified risky health-seeking practices. Then there was the issue of inadequate and uh, under resource health services. There was that issue where they go to that health center, they are told drugs are out of stock, go buy outside. So when they are told that next time, they say, there's no need of me going there. 
to be told they are not with the medication. So that's also a gap, especially in the public sector. There was an issue about the access, affordability, and availability of healthcare. That's why they 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 say the health seeking behavior is a bit risky because they don't go through the proper channels of seeking medical care. So of course we also identified lack of a detailed guidance on use of, of antibiotics. And so this one we are trying to do at the hospital level by ensuring we have those committees, we educate our staff, we educate even our patients as they wait to be served about the, the, the proper use of antimicrobials. So even the, the other thing of the driver of antimicrobial resistance is perception of quality of medicine. They insist on a certain brand or they want injection, they don't want oral medication because they believe this one is superior to this one. And this one, Dr. Ibn mentioned, uh, weak enforcement and awareness of regulation on medication. We really need to up our game, especially through our regulatory body, the Pharmacy and Poisons Board of Kenya. So I'm just coming to the end. So from the study, I've just tried to summarize the whole study. So the, the recommendation for citizens and communities were at least to feel empowered to play a role. They need to own the process in tackling AMR by changing practices in assessing, using and misusing antimicrobials and also proactively engage in efforts to gather the citizen generated data. So to the national government, especially Dr. Eileen where she sits and the Frank and the Minister of Education and ourselves as the county government policymakers, at least we are able to make investments in antimicrobial resistance and public health priority. In our budget lines, when we are doing the annual work plan, the budget lines, let's allocate funds to, for activities to, to increase awareness about antimicrobial resistance and to enforce appropriate use of antimicrobials. So also promote AMR stewardship. Dr. Ibn has very well covered that. So, and then we need to embrace citizen generated data as a critical source of on a par with official or, or, or on a par with official data sources. At least let's incorporate it. As we collect surveillance system from the from, from the from the laboratory, we get data from the hospitals. Let's also engage the citizen as a critical source of data. To the research community especially Frank, explore ways to incorporate citizens' voices in research studies that target challenges on AMR. Healthcare workers, where I fall, at least we drive quality patient engagement on AMR to tackle misinformation and improve levels of trust with citizens. From our study, when you ask them, who, who do you trust to give you information about antimicrobials? They say these healthcare workers. It's only that sometimes they, maybe they are busy so they want to clear the lines. They, are, they don't take uh, enough time with the patients just to explain to them about proper use of antimicrobials. And also as healthcare workers, let's take a holistic approach in addressing AMR in terms of animal, human, environment, food and crops, health, and also how they interact in a one health approach that can lead to antimicrobial resistance in a patient that you are seeing. So conclusion, clearly we were able to see there's a clear relation between knowledge and the use and misuse of antimicrobials. So most citizens in Kenya are not knowledgeable about antimicrobials or AMR. We need to do something about that. Only accurate information they obtain is through interaction with healthcare workers. That one clearly came out. So as healthcare workers, we also had to, to interact more, create more time to explain to them about the importance of getting the taking the correct dose for the right duration and finishing the dose. I want to end there. Thank you. Back to you, Dr. Chats. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hilary. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for all the presentations. We're not too many of us, so I'm going to encourage everyone to turn on your video if you can, but also feel free to unmute yourself and speak and ask questions. So first of all, we want to take questions. If there's any questions coming, uh, panelists, you can also ask your colleagues to explain any aspect we are not clear. So just have a, this is a Q&A session and discussion. So. We'll take some questions first, uh, points coming out from the presentations. And uh, following that, I have some questions I've posted on the chat to help guide the discussion. So uh, any, 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 any comments or questions coming from the presentations first? Thank you for Hilary on the points. I don't, it's a long, it's a lot of them to summarize, but uh, your your presentation has been very rich. As colleagues are thinking of preparing your questions, we've had uh, we've had points around the uh, around the importance of citizens' knowledge, which is very which is very useful for tipsy, but also in the in the approach, but also practices and habits around the uh, around antimicrobial resistance, and then uh, issues on regulations, regulations and 
on drug use and misuse. And uh, there is a similar project we're doing on cancer care where some of these issues you're discussing here as, uh, is, uh, is reverberating with the work I'm doing on that project, but also related to practices, you know, and habits and regulations. So any comments, first of all, before we go into the discussions, the general questions we want to look at. Okay, in the absence of comments, do, have we all seen the questions that I posed? Which will go back to the audience, and, but also to, if you, don't, if you don't see it on the chat, I can put the slide up, but I think it will be better for us to look, to look at ourselves rather than have another slide presentation. So I cannot put the slide up. Should we start with the first one? There are challenges that have been raised and points that have been raised from your presentations, issues that have been raised, one of it being around impact. So talking about, uh, Evelyn was talking about having done one health concept for five years, uh, you're not happy with the level of impact. So those are issues around challenges, but also it is something reflected by, by Hillary. So if we take that, for example, that links into our first questions then, in what ways can the TIP approach help to address some of the challenges? I've just mentioned one of it, the challenges identified, but also foster innovation, and then uh, harness opportunities that may exist. Uh, less of the opportunities were discussed, but more of the challenge were discussed. So I think Frank will be, will be more deeper in terms of the TIPS approach than Hilary and Evelyn. So. <laughs> You may want to help help colleagues also understand by responding first of all how you see the tip approach helping to address some of this challenge uh, system level impact which uh, Evelyn was talking about is one of the goal you like to see in the project is one area where the, the the transformative innovation policy approach is very is very important so let's start with Frank first and then uh, the, uh, we can have Hilary or Evelyn come in. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to thank um, Dr. Evelyn and um, Kagwa for their very rich, uh, you know, presentations. I've, I've learned some, we have been meeting, but uh, some of the things you have said, I've never heard you say before, <laughs> which is very, very good. And it helps me get a clear picture, you know, from the practitioners in the health policy space and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, other on the ground which is very, very important. Um, I just want to, you know, there is something that we don't care, you know, about in terms of directionality. When we are, you know, conceptualizing our project, we don't care where we are going to, where we are heading. And, uh, you know, through, we will, when you look at all these policies, all the busy, you know, you know, all the activities that we have, it is not clear to point out where we are heading. I think with the tips, uh, we should be able, when we look at TIP and what we are doing, we should be able to now start imagining the future with the direction that that, that we would have taken. Um, so in my view, you know, because you can imagine you are driving a vehicle and you don't know where you're heading. You're very busy, you know, you know, engaging and, 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 and steering, but you don't know where you're heading. You can't tell where, you can't imagine the end of the road. So I think uh, directionality is very important and it has to start, you know, it has to be visualized in policies. It has to be visualized in the, in the, in the innovations that, uh, that we have, because even in the innovation space, there's a lot, you know, a lot of innovation. Can you imagine what is happening in terms of development of apps? These apps are being developed and they are being used uh, to access drugs, to access services. So what is the direction we are taking and uh, you know how do we determine uh, which innovation to prioritize i think when we look at what is happening through tip and then uh, somehow we can develop a criteria that can enable us to prioritize or give more more more, more space to to a certain policy or to a certain innovation uh, and that would be good uh, I would also want to talk about, um, I like talking about unlearning, 
uh, I find from my experience, I may be just a, a very biased kind of observation. Uh, we have to have a lot of unlearning in the healthcare sector. If you look at the pharmaceutical companies, they are the ones who boxed us into these, uh, you know, situation where we have hyped the performance of certain products. Uh, I remember during those uh, monopoly days, uh, if it's malaria, you know, malaria queen is the drug for treating malaria, but there are so many other drugs. So uh, we have actually forced our patients and uh, the population to think that way, that this is a better, a better medication than they had. But um, so when you look at the problem, the burden through tip approach, I think we should be able to come up with uh, some strategies that can help us and learn as, as citizens, as practitioners, we should be able to unlearn. We should do a lot of unlearning for us to create room to get in new knowledge and, and adopt new practices. And um, uh, finally, let me just comment on the system level impact. It's not easy to, you know, to bring transformation through all these systems. I remember uh, in, in one of the NRF reviews, when you put different experts, you know, uh, different experts in agriculture, in, in health, the kind of debate that you hear is just baffling. Uh, especially in terms of leadership. Uh, they argue who is going to take lead. And um, recently I heard another version of it where, you know, in those meetings I had people calling, you know, either each other different, uh, connota using different connotations, coming because they want to communicate. As Evelyn, you said, MR is a problem of, has a problem of communication, is a communication problem or has some burden of communication. So even our experts, for them to come back, you know, down to the common uh, people uh, with, in a language that they can be understood, they are also finding it difficult. Some of them, the veterinary doctors were saying, you, you know, they were being called, uh, you know, farmers and these other people are calling the medics, the health, uh, you know, uh, medical doctors are being called names, which, you know, you laugh because it is not easy to simplify the language, how we have sophisticated we have become. Uh, so in my view, we need to look at tips so that we can look at a system level impact. How do we attain that what we are looking for uh, using the programs that we have? And one way of doing it is to develop uh, outcomes that can be used by our practitioners to measure, uh, you know, what we are, we are achieving. This idea of looking at numbers, you know, if you look at all our programs, it's about numbers, the number of hospitals, the number of patients, the number of those who have infected. I think we need to gradually grow it so that we look at transformative outcomes that can enrich uh, our, our activities and can make them more, much more sustainable. Thank you, Jax. Back to you. Thank you. I think you've set it up very nicely for Evelyn to come in because uh, <laughs> some of the points you're making just links yeah. to Evelyn directly because yeah, issues of uh, impact that Evelyn said. So yeah, we want impact, but there are challenges and links to that or why Evelyn, as you mentioned, we're about the five years down the line, we have not achieved the level of impact we expect. So uh, there's issues of impact. There's also outcomes. How do we measure the outcome? What kind of outcomes do we need to look at? And then uh, the importance of applying the tip approach quite strongly but the first one you started is a with a directionality how do we ensure in policies i think we'll come back to that very strongly again in terms of policies and regulation and uh, ensuring that this is built into both the program level uh, project level but also policy level so evelyn there are at least five points for you to pick up on so choose the one you want to take on yeah. and uh, expand thank you yeah thank you i think i'll pick up from some of the conversations that uh the points that Frank has raised and for me very strongly picking on the unlearning mm. because I think we are we have gotten used to developing policies in a certain way so when I hear that I have to develop or lead the process of developing a policy I it is automatic it's like you are on autopilot you know uh, for all policies this is a process and this is what we expect but I think uh, the place of unlearning is going to be a critical place especially for those that are driving policy decisions. If you're to have directionality, it will not be achieved in the absence of unlearning. What we think works 
because like I say, five years down the line, it doesn't mean that we haven't done much. We have done a lot, but is it taking us to where we are going? You can drive kilometers and miles up away, but then you realize, is, is this my final destination? So for me to have directionality, I believe we must unlearn a lot of the things which we thought are the right things and the right ways of doing something. And I think uh, that's why Hillary, uh, Hillary's presentation comes in, even as we participated in this citizen-generated data for action. Again, it also opened our eyes that we are so used to the conventional way of doing things. And we are not quick to open up to other innovative ways which tend to push, at, push us out of our comfort zones. So I think, first of all, working through the place of um, and learning what we think is, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is the right way is something that I think through the project that we are undertaking, the data and the evidence will point strongly towards the need to unlearn some of those concepts which we thought work. Because you know, you can have an idea and a concept that doesn't uh, take you to where you want to be. If it's, a, it's um, for example, an action. And I, I just want to give an example. Today we were talking about surgical site infections, post cesarean sections, for example. That is a, an outcome. A surgical site infection is a patient outcome. And when we started talking about the possible causes and how we can address it, we were so focused on looking at the healthcare setting. And one person just said, I think you people need to look at the social determinants for health. Are you considering the environment your patient is going into? You can do all that you can in your healthcare setting, but when they get to their homes and the level of hygiene is low, they will still end up with a surgical site infection post cesarean. So I think that's unlearning. What I propose as an intervention might only work to a certain extent. And I must actually uh, now go into policy making processes and setting interventions with a very open mind. I think for me, this is what um, this whole TIP uh, approach is, uh, is, uh, uh, is bringing my way as a person who's in policy and leading the process that I must be open to new ideas, I must be open to new ways. And uh, one other thing that we have also learned as we have begun to embrace this steep approach is a place of deep learning, which we have not had. We probably are just going through, you know, uh, fast order learning and, and things like that. So we are now beginning to rethink our processes. Do we pause to even review the impact of our proposed interventions? I think we are on a on a, on a, on a, like it's a roller coaster, we are just moving, but the place of stopping or pausing to really review what you have proposed, is it working or not working, to enable us change our behaviors and practice uh, has been learning, so it uh, has been lacking. So I think for, from my end, those are three, uh, three or four aspects that uh, really speak uh, to our processes for us to be able to do better. And finally, the place of inclusivity. And inclusivity doesn't mean our conventional stakeholders. We must go beyond what we are um, we considered the traditional stakeholders we have involved in our conversation. And that is what has triggered the language problem for AMR. Experts have been talking to experts from 1956 to 2021. We are preaching to the choir. So we have not learned. So that's the unlearning that we need to do that we actually have to change. And I think um, maybe that's what I can say with respect to applying this. And I'm thinking for every policy review process, now my thinking is that the first item on the agenda should be TIP, so that you set people's minds thinking in the right direction. Otherwise, if you go into it the, the normal way, we will come out with the same old um, uh, outcome. And uh, I think it will, not be, uh, it will not be doing justice to a system which we know needs an innovative approach if we are to see a difference in the way we are using antimicrobials. Thank you, Chuck. So I hand it over back to you. Thank you. So Hillary is going to have a lot more work to do now. There's more points, but uh, the point you mentioned around pause moments, which is a time to wait and think. And uh, in tipsy language, we use the word reflexivity. And we've seen that is one of the biggest problems with policymakers. No mm. space to actually stop, to actually learn, mm. to go back for mm. training, That's to spend true. one week doing what we're doing now. So policies formulated and they just continue to implement and run. And it takes two, three or five years as you've uh, 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 analyzed uh, Evelyn before we discover that things are not working. So what are the space every, every year, every six months, every moment to reflect, 
to learn to, uh, to to develop the principles, but also the practice of uh, adapt adaptability and this kind of point. So these are some of the things that uh, where the tip approach can help, but also inclusivity, which I've reiterated a few times, that is very very strong uh, component or aspect of Tipsy, which is a uh, thinking about engagement and how do we engage new ways of engaging actors so realizing that the grassroots actors citizens are also a big part of the solution you know so so i think uh, that's a good place for hillary to come in because she's been talking to us about citizens so how do we not leave them behind in the sdg thinking we can leave them behind for various reasons and uh, but also avoid experts talking to experts quoting uh, Evelyn. you know it's how do we address this so apply the tipsy approach hilary over to you thank you thank you everyone thank you jacks so uh but I, I i didn't mention i think i'm sitting at a very uh, uh unfavorable position because dr evelyn has been my mentor on matters amr so telling me to speak after her uh, i i'll try not to repeat most of the things she has mentioned but uh yeah i think A bit of challenge with the uh, video. Is it clear now? Uh, yeah, you're back now. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, I think, uh, like she mentioned, we really need to to rethink our strategies, and especially, I tend to be biased towards uh, the citizen. Like she has mentioned, uh, we are preaching to the already converted. Let's now go out. Let, let, let's try to look for innovative ways of engaging the citizens on on AMR. As a county, we, we realize we don't have to tackle AMR just from healthcare settings. So we are working together with the chiefs, with the market, with the public health officials, as they go to do their public barazas, their meetings, at least that aspect of AMR is also included in, in those discussions. And the areas are the, according to the National Action Plan on Antimicrobial Resistance in, for Kenya, they are far, basically five major strategic uh, objectives that is awareness surveillance infection prevention and control rational use of antimicrobial which dr Evelyn clearly touched on and research so as of awareness i think how do we engage this public how can we capture them do we have to wait for them to come to the healthcare setting where they are sick or seeking care to to be informed about amr can we have innovative ways of engaging them and increasing awareness in churches I, I think we really need to relook our strategy. For surveillance, I'll not go much, but I, maybe we can try to increase the data on surveillance. So I, I know in Kenya we have a program called ECHO where we share information across the country on the resistant patterns that are coming up. Is there something else that we are not doing right in that aspect? Could we have some form of mobile applications like anywhere seated, anywhere from any corner of the country, they can submit? Is there the public can, can also be encouraged to report at a certain like a uh, like a text message using a, a a code how do we engage them to to report or even their behavior from home in terms of surveillance i think infection prevention there are so many innovative ways especially with the coming of covid pandemic i think ipc measures has really been uh, advertising through the media social media uh, TVs, radios about hand washing, social distancing. I think it all, it all, it has also helped in a way in reducing the infection because I think we have realized a, quite a, a, a reduction in infectious diseases. So, but I think we can have more innovative ways of uh, conducting infection prevention and control. For rational use, of course, we need to engage our healthcare workers. But now the question is, we have been, en been engaging with them. What are in, I'm trying to think, what are the, how can we package the, same inform the, the information in a different way to, in to, to increase the adherence to these guidelines? So I think where I wanted to, to dwell much is on the research. As Dr. Eden can rightly accord, I think for uh, uh, among the, the five pillars of uh, addressing AMR, I think uh, research is the area we are really dragging on. So I think we, there are so many areas on AMR that, we, uh, that are innovative ways that you can do research on to improve how we are combating this thing. So research, research, we really need to think of innovative ways. The citizen-generated data is a very important tool. Which other method can we uh, to, 
can we employ to push this machine that grows? So I want to end there, Jokes. Thank you. Thank you, Hilary. Nine, 90 minutes wow. runs past. We have mm. five. We uh, uh, thank you. Um, I've been, okay. yeah. yeah, hello, Jokes. Um, We're hearing some obviously, background from someone else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yes, um, uh, I've been participating actively and, and I really enjoy listening to many of the speakers. Um, my uh, observation or questions, uh, I want to ask uh, Dr. Hillary, where he, during his presentation, uh, he made mention of how the antimicrobial are resistant in where he works and how they teach, monitoring, and what are some of the interviews they do with the people in the grassroots. So uh, I want to ask, uh, is there this antimicrobial resistance uh, that you did? Uh, do you take cognizance of how um, the process of prescription uh, to, 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 to the users and how does this uh, affect the, the, the long-term resistance among people. Uh, because in, usually you see prescription comes from either doctors in hospital or directly from pharmacists. And some get into this, uh, 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 some get into use of these anti, uh, antimicrobial drugs, mostly without going back for, you know, the, uh, prescription. So possibly you have used it before, it works for me. The next time you have something similar, you want to take, you want to go to this pharmacy or chemist to just buy it without going back to 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 doctors to see if really that will work for you again and again. So and I think the studies have shown that some of these cases happens, especially in the global south, in African context, where the resistance uh, it, it tends to create more resistance among people. Thank you. Yeah, I was just saying, Hilary, you dropped off briefly. So over to you. Abbas didn't introduce himself, but he's a, he's a, he's a researcher at Spru. So, yeah. so Hilary, over to you. So sorry, sorry, sorry about to, that. I, sorry I, about I, that. I, I, Okay. I had to switch to another internet because I think the Wi-Fi was uh, not behaving, so I had to switch to my phone. That's but I, I, I didn't get the question well. I think I, at some point where he mentioned prescriptions, I think maybe, uh, Dr. Charles, maybe you can just elaborate for me the question so that I, I didn't get the last part of the question. I think his question was around the prescription part where it's by doctors or by pharmacists sometimes. And in, a, in Global South, what he's pointing to was where they get prescription once for one problem and then next time they just go back and buy that medication and uh, without the long-term effect of uh, what may be happening so you touched on that <clears> in your, <throat> your presentation it could be prescription for malaria or for cough or throat they go they get they get antibiotics but then in the future they just see this is a problem we have and we continue to get antibiotics uh, the same thing they, yeah. without further examination or prescription they just repeat how about is that correct yeah, exactly. So, and yeah. of course, this has shown that it creates a lot of resistance to, to, to medication at the long run. So, did you gather uh, data or evidence on that in your research? And what is the long term implication? That's where Abbas was trying to understand a bit more. And uh, after you, I think we, 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 we go to uh, Evelyn and uh, to Frank to finalize. I won't come back. I won't say anything again after that to bring your final point, but also reflect on the last two questions. We didn't take on too much. You can uh, address that a little bit in your final and closing comments. So Hilary and then uh, Evelyn and then Frank. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, in our study, we really concentrated from the citizen part. Eh? but even also on the communication to healthcare workers, because if you remember, we had the groups from the public and also healthcare workers. So for the healthcare workers, how we try to address the issue of prescription, first of all, is what we call medicine and therapeutics committee in a hospital, where these are the committees that give guidelines on how, which antibiotics you stock in a facility. And more so, when we come to the AMS committees, they, they, they even have the powers to, to, to allocate 
which and which level of antibiotic if you use the <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> if you use the aware classification of antibiotics there are those that are uh, they are commonly used. They are those that have that have to be reserved for very serious infection to avoid their resistance. So through those committees, they can regulate in a hospital setup according to the qualification. Are you a clinical officer? Are you a medical officer? Are you a consultant? So one of the way of regulating the prescription of medicines or antimicrobials is by having guidelines on who should, should who should uh, prescribe what on the level of antibiotic. Of course, the issue of training of the, prescri of the prescribers is a very important aspect. Now, coming to the patient, according to the law governing prescriptions, unless it's a chronic medication prescription, which has a prescription should indicate the dosage and the duration. If it's five days and it should be dated with the name of the patient. So unless it is written to refill, so if you're a professional at a pharmacy or a chemist, you should only deal with a fresh prescription. If the the medication were written for five days, 10 days. It's, it's unprofessional. I, I know the patient can go back looking for it, but if you really are a professional, and that's where Dr. Ibn mentioned, we really need the, the, regulation, the regulation aspect and, uh, enforced. Eh? We really need to, to make sure people are only dispensed antibiotic with a proper prescription and a valid prescription, not on a previous pre prescription. If you need to a refill, you have to go back to the prescriber or the clinician to review to change. Because I, I agree with you, that's a major driver of antimicrobial resistance. As in fact, if I could look, have gone deeper into the our findings, some patients reported they use the antibiotics. Maybe they have been prescribed for five days. Then after two days, the kid gets better. So the neighbor comes and say, my kid is coughing, he has a running nose. Then the, the person tells, ah, mine I didn't finish, let me assist you. My, my kid also has a, had a similar issue, go use this. You see, now those are drivers of antimicrobials, of, of, of antimicrobial resistance. So it, there are far uh, cross-cutting issues, but I think from the healthcare system, we need to regulate how we prescribe, rational prescribing, which has to be, to go hard in hand in the training on the uh, proper selection of antimicrobial. The important also aspect we realize is that we need as clinicians to take time to counsel, even at the pharmacy level. When you dispense antimicrobial, take time to explain why you need to finish this dose and don't finish the dose. If the, if the duration is five days and they are remaining like a syrup, uh, bring it back to the hospital, they're going to, be, to dispose it for you to avoid also the, so that we can consider the One Health approach. Thank you. I hope I've uh, addressed your concern, Abbas. But it's a, it's yeah, a thing that's that we good. need. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Well, thank you, Hillary and Chucks, and to all of us for the great discussions and conversations we've had today. I think uh, my summary is just um, um, one. I, I, I think point is one. There's definitely a place for tip when it comes to uh, the formulation of public health policies and having been in the policy formulation implementation process for more than five years, I realize we've had a gap. And I think for me, that's the best thing that when you realize there's an issue and you have an opportunity of rectifying the process, then I definitely say it's possible to employ the tip approach for better policy development. So what that means is just, um, the process must uh, embrace and integrate tip approaches from the beginning to the end. So I think for me, that's my, my parting shot. I see a lot of benefit, And I think once that happens, our next cycle of policies will be actionable. I think that's one of the things we've, we've, we've lacked, actionable policies, sustainable policies. But I'm sure once you embrace the tip approach, the aspect of um, practicality and sustainability will definitely be addressed. And also the, the, the aspects of behavior change we intend to, to achieve in, through a lot of the interventions we have are easier because when people are involved in a process, then you propose a solution, then the implementation uh, thereafter becomes much easier as opposed to just having a, a top-down um, approach in, uh, in policy development. So I want to say thank you the opportunity and I think uh, we are excited about this um, initiative and we are looking forward to seeing how this is going to impact on our next edition of the policy which actually happens this year and uh, I think it will be a good experiment Chucks, to see whether or not these things we've been talking about can actually make a difference at the end of the next cycle 2027 if uh, we will be around 
we should be speaking a different language. Thank you and over to you, Frank. Thank you, over to you, Frank. Frank, you are mute. Sorry for that. Uh, Chats in colleagues and uh, participants, thank you so much for having been with us. It's a very, very important uh, thing to notice how we have been sharing uh, insights. And um, one of the things that, uh, that I would like to mention that we are getting from this particular you know, conference is the cheap way of doing things from you know, developing policies all the way to implementation and never forgetting the aspect of learning and unlearning. It has to be a continuous process. We have noticed through this particular conference that, um, uh, you know, everybody should be learning from the experts uh, up to, you know, the citizens who are supposed to be benefiting from this. They have to keep on learning. And if we do that, then uh, MR, antimicrobial resistance will no longer be a language problem. Everything will flow the way it has flow, amen, the way we have demonstrated through this particular conference. And uh, one of the things that we really need to unlearn is the, the linear way of modeling, the linear way, you know, we were, you know, we developed these and it has been with us for a long time. Every time we do something, we develop a project, we develop a policy, we assume that things will follow a linear pattern. Communication from experts will be followed by communications you know, of the lay people. But unfortunately, things in the world, doesn't, they don't work like that. So we have to use tips, or tip, sorry, to ensure that uh, oh, there's a flow of events in communication, uh, in reflexivity, in uh, learning and unlearning, and all the way as we transform our systems. Um, thank you so much for being with us. And I'm, uh, I know uh, as this project is supporting and that element of research and development of the National Action Plan, uh, we, we are very much willing and very much happy that uh, uh, we will move it to a ne the next level. And we hope the Ministry of Health at large will benefit from uh, the data that we'll collect in, uh, and uh, surely uh, there is space for tips in these particular two you know, spaces. Thank you so much. Thank you all for those final words. I like the way it's also ended with learning. I've learned a lot. I've been part of the project, but uh, this is the first <laughs> deep presentation I'm seeing on the project. So it's been very useful for me as well. Frank can attest to that. Uh, we're part of uh, the proposal and things, but I've been looking for opportunities as well to learn. So thank you. We're mm -hmm. ending on the note for learning, but also experimentation and research. So for us to change, Many of these points we've been talking about experimentation is going to be key. We have to experiment on different way, as Hilary is saying, of engaging people, not the original way we've been doing. Uh, Evelyn has also confirmed that we have to experiment on different way of policy development. And uh, coming to Frank as well, we have to experiment on different way of learning. Why are we not learning? Or do, I mean, if we drop this linear model of uh, thinking with the formulate policy ideas, we pass it on to people and implement. We have, without experimentation, we can't find different ways of doing this so that we actually know then what works and why they should work. So part of this will now be, again, to focus on uh, experimentation, beginning to think of experiment on different ways of uh, engagement or policy development. I'm not going to the autopilot, as uh, everyone was saying. This is a once we have a policy <laughs> to develop, we for just follow what we what we've done forever and just say this is the way to do it and continue without uh, knowing that. So thank you all. Most important, I think more than all of you have done the highest learning because you're implementing in different yeah. dimensions. But for me, I really looked at the presentations before you did, and it's a, it's very rich. And thanks a lot. Um, thank you. It's final. I think uh, we all see you again in the closing session. So thank you. And uh, thanks to Carlos, who's been observing, but also thanks a lot to Francisco, who has been our technical uh, behind the scene, working to, to, to make sure these sessions go on. Thank you, Francisco. Mm -hmm. And so, you. and then uh, to colleagues and participants who joined. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. To see you at the, at the closing session. Oh, what a 